Tonight, Team 10 investigates police power and a culture of corruption. And his reaction was, <laughs> Then he said, Why the f do you have to tell me? They have the power to take away our freedom. I said, he stopped this girl because she's cute. The power to exert influence. How about if you have sex with me? I mean, th th that's what he said right in front of the younger officer. Some are accused of abusing that power. We pulled up to my house and I gave him oral sex. Predators allowed to persist. How early on in your training did this occur? <clears throat> Since day one. Hidden behind a badge and a gun. There's a hint here of some sort of corruption, some level of nepotism and favoritism and pulling strings. Accountability has been promised. Is it possible to do what you're saying with that culture. It's a scandal that has already cost San Diego millions. Do you feel that the police department created this culture of liability that you now have to defend? And left a sobering question hanging in the air. Who will guard the guardians? Good evening, I'm Team 10 investigator Mitch Blocker. New sources, new video, and relentless reporting are giving us an inside look at how the San Diego Police Department upheld its symbol of protection. One cop is already in prison, another faces multiple felony charges, all as the Department of Justice conducts its own investigation into police culture. Our investigation begins with a man you will recognize, that convicted cop. His story serves to peel back layers of corrupt culture that allowed some cops to abuse their badge and assault women while on duty, all as others allowed it to happen. They call it the code of silence. You're about to see deep inside the San Diego Police Department's inner circle. Do you have concerns about your safety and your family's safety, though, as a result of coming forward? Yes, to this day. You'll hear from current and former officers as they describe the disease a corrupt culture inflicts on a city police department. What do these friendships and these connections mean for the public when it comes to the community and its police department? It means the public has a corrupt police department. That's what it means. That's what it is. There are allegations the most powerful weren't held accountable. We were told not to by some people. Okay. Who told you not to? Higher up in the commands. Okay. How high up in the commands? All the way to Chief Lansdowne. Much of this peek behind the department's veil comes courtesy of officers who were not part of the club and those forced to testify in depositions. You're either in the club or you're not in the club. If you're in the club, the department takes care of you and the department will go to bat for you. If you're not in the club, they'll hang you out to dry. Art Perea was one of the men left out to dry. His 17 years as a San Diego cop didn't hold much weight when he was accused of rape. You got the screw job. Yes. Because you weren't in the club. Yes. And that other members of the department who were in the club and who participated in the same kind of conduct are still there. And they get protected and sometimes promoted. Correct. Despite it. Correct. Perea was never charged. He resigned from the department, yet now convicted cop Anthony Arevalos thrived, assaulting at least 13 women while on duty. Arevalos, seen here in a jailhouse deposition, said his behavior was learned. How early on in your training did this occur? <clears throat> Since day one. He claimed he was almost encouraged to abuse his badge, dared to see how long he could get away with it. His former partner, Francisco Torres, said in multiple depositions that the department's most crooked cop had one huge advantage. He was more than in the club. He was close friends with his supervisors. They would go out and, I guess you can call it party together, go drinking, go bar hopping, go see women together. Those relationships and the department's code of silence would be tested time and time again with Arevalos, first when he was accused of photographing a mentally ill woman as she performed sex acts with his police baton in the back of his squad car. He had his Polaroid out, and when I got there, the, the female was in the back seat again naked with her handcuffs in front of her, and she had the baton. He admitted to that conduct, correct? Correct. <clears throat> and you thought that conduct was serious, correct? It was serious. He was doing it in a joking manner, but yes. This is Arevalos' former supervisor, Lieutenant Rudy Tai. It's a name you'll hear again. I believe they were serious. I was able or we were able to correct that type of behavior. So your impression was that um, Officer Arevalos' behavior had been corrected in this regard, is that right? After your counseling with him? Yes. 
Torres also told his supervisor, Sergeant Danny Hollister, about what Arevalos did. And his reaction was, <laughs> Then he said, why the f did you have to tell me? And literally my jaw dropped thinking, really? I'm not supposed to tell you when something like this happens. We have no written documentation that that ever happened. It's an so, allegation. Under oath, San Diego's deputy chief, David Ramirez, said the Baton incident was never fully investigated. He described a confidential meeting with Chief William Lansdowne. According to court transcripts, Ramirez said to Lansdowne, quote, we have a problem. Lansdowne said, I want to do one thing and one thing only find that documentation. The chief never told you, I want to know if this is true, correct? <clears throat> I don't remember him saying that exactly, no. And the chief never said, I want to find out if uh, um, somebody was covering for Anthony Revelos, correct? Objection argumentative. That I don't remember that being part of the discussion. Arevalo stayed on the street where he'd periodically pop up on internal affairs radar. Whether it was for having pornography on his computer or women's underwear in his locker, he seemed bulletproof. Because of the fact that he was in IA so many, so many times and so often, he referred to himself uh, as the Teflon Don because nothing would ever stick to him. It's how Perea said the club was supposed to work. You're Teflon. Meaning what? Nothing sticks to you. You can be accused of almost anything and you'll get by. You'll be all right. It worked again when Arevalos pulled over a 16-year-old girl in La Jolla. Chief Lansdowne was asked about it when it was his turn to testify. As I recall, he said that uh, Officer Arevalos, according to the father, made this young lady bend over inappropriately and he was looking at her uh, behind. Hundreds of upskirt photos were discovered on Arevalos' cell phone. They show his fetish for this type of traffic stop. Almost all of them went unreported, but that 16-year-old girl's father was friends with a cop. That officer, Art Bowen, filed a formal complaint. Five years later, sex crimes detective Lori Adams interviewed him as she investigated Arevalos' conduct. Bowen described how command handled the incident. This is the first time that conversation has been played publicly. He cuts me off. He said, well, I'll tell you what I don't appreciate. I don't appreciate the fact that you put this in writing and that you're siding with civilians and you're siding with these people before you and, and turning against an officer. I said, I didn't turn against an officer. Mm -hmm. I know this girl. This girl is not lie. What hey, happened was... When they do wrong, they do wrong. Period. Right. I said, he stopped her for no reason. Her license plate doesn't expire for months. Yeah. I said, he stopped this girl because she's cute. And did you think that um, uh, sex crimes should have been notified? No. Why not? I didn't think it rose to that level. Even though the young lady was minor. Well, my understanding is the young lady didn't think anything happened. That would not be the last time Chief Lansdowne appeared uninterested or uninformed about sexual assault allegations against Anthony Arevalos. One of the next times happened near the 163 in Friars Road underpass. It involved a pair of blue rubber gloves and a woman in the back seat of Arevalos' squad car. This time, Arevalos was accused of sexually assaulting a woman in his custody. He was taking her to jail, pulled under the freeway, and sexually assaulted her. Arevalos again found himself under the internal affairs spotlight. This was the twelfth time it was proven he sexually assaulted a woman while on duty. Had you ever heard the name Anthony Arevalos before then? I don't believe so. Even with another internal affairs investigation in full swing, Arevalos was eager to get back to work. This email, hidden in court records, shows he asked then-patrol chief Robert Kanaski if he could get back to work. Arevalos wrote, I just wanted to ask you if you have any idea when I would be able to return to the field. I also have no idea if it is possible to return to the field while IA is pending. Chief Kanaski responds, my goal is to get you in the field as quickly as possible. I will not be waiting for the entire investigation to be completed. As Arevalos was put back on patrol, the clock was ticking. Ten months later, he assaulted his 13th victim in a 7-Eleven bathroom. By March 2011, he was under arrest. 
it appeared the code of silence had finally been broken. Arevalos' trial and the civil cases that would follow would reveal some of the San Diego Police Department's dirtiest secrets, the biggest of secrets, that Anthony Arevalos was not alone. That part of the story when Team 10 investigates police power and a culture of corruption continues. The code of silence was starting to crack. By the time Anthony Arevalos was sent to prison, San Diego police officers had had enough. The code couldn't keep them quiet anymore. The only way we're going to prevent that from happening again is by restructuring the San Diego Police Department. This was the first officer to speak with us on camera. He asked that we hide his identity out of fear of retaliation. Nearly a dozen officers had been speaking to us behind the scenes, saying things like bad cops were being protected. They said that protection came from the very top of the department. The decision makers are the ones that have this nepotism, this buddy system, the golden boy system. That's where it starts. What do these friendships and these connections mean for the public when it comes to the community and its police department? It means the public has a corrupt police department. That's what it means. That's what it is. The officer mentioned one case where gang unit detectives covered their colleagues DUI. One of the detectives was under the influence of alcohol, driving, and hit an electrical box. The group of detectives and sergeants that covered it up are still there. If you look hard through this grainy surveillance tape, you can see the crash. A car spins out of control, the headlights briefly glaring into the camera. Court records show the SDPD's internal investigation into the crash identifies a number of sergeants and officers, some of whom worked with Arevalos, who were referred for criminal charges. The records show a Sergeant English and his subordinate, Officer Witt, intentionally falsified police reports. The record says they admitted it and they were never charged either criminally or administratively. In California, falsifying a police report is a felony. Ironically, Anthony Arevalo seems to offer a reason why this kind of corruption was tolerated. He said everyone involved was in the club. Did that also go to um, deputy district attorneys? Of course. And, and, uh, San, and uh, uh, San Diego city attorneys? Of course. And their investigators? Yes. There were other scandals that appear to fit the profile Arevalos describes. Take the ticket fixing scandal. A San Diego County deputy DA got probation. The San Diego cop who made her traffic citation disappear no longer works for the department. But scandals like this one were about to fade into the background. A familiar symptom of the code of silence was about to reveal itself. Another cop was arrested and charged with sexual battery and false imprisonment. Crimes prosecutors say he committed while on duty. When Team 10 broke the story, we immediately took our questions to Chief Lansdowne. The way it's been described to me is this I, is I another Anthony Arevalos. It's not. It's very active right now. Okay. Has he been suspended? Yes. I, I mean, suspended. He's, he's taken away his police powers and he's not at work. In later interviews, the chief downplayed the severity. This is not skin-to-skin -skin touching. This is improper searches. I'm hearing the exact opposite, that this was a Revelos squared. I don't know of any women that came forward and said they actually had sex with Mr. Revelos. But that's what I'm hearing on this one. Women came forward to tell their stories. We were talking and he was like, you know that I could take you to jail. I was like, but I wasn't driving the car. I didn't do anything. He's like, well, if you go down on me, I won't take you to jail. We pulled up to my house and I gave him oral sex. He drops his hands towards his growing area and thrust his hips and says, just touch it. There were immediately questions about Officer Christopher Hayes' training and vetting. His father-in-law, Mark Jones, was an assistant chief. Chief Lansdowne tried to defuse the scrutiny. I think we do an incredibly good job and, and people want to play the blame game and they want to criticize, but they don't understand the system. Hayes resigned from the department to fight his criminal case. He says he is innocent. So does former officer Donnie Moncrief, who was investigated for sexual misconduct. He has not been charged. He's suing the city for irreparable and immeasurable damage because of the investigation. With new investigations and the old wounds from Anthony Arevalo still raw, there were many questions. The answers, well, they came from a familiar place, police culture. How about if you have sex with me? I mean, th th that's what he said, right in front of the younger officer. 
Attorney Joe Dix described a night 14 years ago in the gas lamp. A woman described in a legal declaration what happened when she was taken into custody by a San Diego police training instructor and the officer he was mentoring. She claims the supervisor said she wasn't sober. She said, quote, I was handcuffed from behind. He patted down my buttocks. And then she says he put her in the police car. She claims, quote, the supervisor asked if I would have sex with him. The young trainee looked shocked. I told the supervisor no way. Her declaration says the supervisor had the trainee book her. This is direct evidence that it's being passed on from senior officer to junior officer. The poster child of corrupt cops, Anthony Arevalos himself, described his training similarly. How early on in your training did this occur? <clears throat> Since day one. There were also new questions about the group charged with investigating the type of sex scandals plaguing the department. This series of frat house style posters hung in the sex crimes office as Arevalos patrolled the city to make light of women victimized by the date rape drug Rohypnol. Others celebrate sex acts, binge drinking, and the female anatomy. Two female sex crimes detectives even filed lawsuits claiming sexual harassment in the sex crimes unit. The man in charge of that unit was someone you may remember, former Arevalo supervisor Rudy Tai. They would go out and, I guess you could call it party together, go drinking, go bar hopping, go see women together. Throughout it all, the public's police watchdog also proved to be toothless. A San Diego grand jury concluded the Citizens Review Board is failing in its mission as the public's watchdog of the San Diego Police Department. Current and former board members talked to Team 10. The people's check of the police department doesn't work. Correct. It's not working. There is no check. I think there's a lot of opportunities for officers who are given a lot of authority to abuse that authority. The board's own data shows that in 2001, it reviewed as many as 133 allegations against officers. By 2009, that dropped to 46. The city was about to literally pay the price. Coming up. To me, it seems like I'm being stalked by the city. A victim under surveillance. For people who would say that it's insensitive for the city attorney to put a sexual assault victim under surveillance, you say what? It's not being insensitive, it's preparing for trial. San Diego on the hook for millions when Team 10 investigates police power and a culture of corruption continues. As San Diego's most crooked cop sat in prison and another cop faced trial, our city attorney geared up to defend what he had called indefensible actions. The settlements alone had already cost the city more than $2 million. She was Anthony Arevalos' final victim. The chief of police has called you courageous for helping to put Anthony Arevalos in prison. Yes. The courts have protected her identity. We only know her as Jane Doe. She was a critical witness in convicting the crooked San Diego cop. Do you feel courageous? I don't know. I feel very scared most of the time. Her assault in a 7-Eleven bathroom was the final straw. The code of silence could no longer protect Arevalos. We're responsible for what this dirt bike did. And we have a victim who's a hero. But that doesn't mean we make bunch of people wealthy and rich over it. City Attorney Jan Goldsmith is responsible for protecting the city's pocketbook, but Doe is suing the city for more than money. She says she also wants independent oversight of the police department. In defending the lawsuit, the city attorney had claimed Doe, quote, bribed Officer Arevalos with her panties to get out of a ticket, but eventually backed off that claim. It didn't stop the city, though, from paying a private investigator to track Doe just to make sure. For people who would say that it's insensitive for the city attorney to put a sexual assault victim under surveillance, you say what? It's not being insensitive, it's preparing for trial. There was never an active private investigator following tailing Anthony Arevalos, yet that is exactly what the city's been doing with Jane Doe. If the city knew, maybe they would have. It was not the first time Jane Doe had been captured by a city surveillance camera. Hi. How you doing? She's seen here working with a San Diego sex crimes detective to prove Arevalos abused his badge and traded tickets for sexual favors. 
You said you wanted to touch me, and then you stopped, and so I don't know if you were upset. Would I have liked to have been there longer with you? Of course I would have liked to have been there longer with you, but, you know, I'm in uniform. Here, Doe is seen being coached by Detective Lori Adams. They silently celebrate as Arevalos admits more and more details of his crimes. It's crazy that, that I'm standing there with no panties on. <laughs> <laughs> you are a grown woman. You, you, you're, you're, you handle it very well. Very well. Police and prosecutors used portions of this recording to convict Arevalos, but it's what they did not share that raises more questions about police culture, and it could lead to a new trial. This is just not another example of, of the misconduct and the corruption and the cover-up practices that go on at the San Diego Police Department. Doe's attorney, Linda Workman, is talking about what happened when Doe reported her assault. Less than 24 hours after Arevalo sexually assaulted her, detectives had her write down what happened. Those notes never made it to trial. The police department took custody of the notes that they had told her to take, and they put them in a drawer and they hid them for two years. Arevalos's lawyers say Doe's notes suggest what Arevalos appears to admit on this tape did not happen. A judge has thrown out two of Arevalos's convictions because of this mistake. Doe's lawyers say the mistake was intentional. The people that would abide by this and not try to correct it uh, have a lot to answer for. It could be a get out of jail free card, a new trial for Arevalos. Coming up, accountability is coming. Do you think the department can move forward with its current leadership? A new leader emerges. For those very few who do not fulfill our standards, your failures will not be tolerated. And the federal government launches a criminal investigation. Were witnesses interviewed? Was all the evidence collected? Were the findings appropriate? Were officers held accountable? When Team 10 investigates police power, a culture of corruption continues. At the height of the police scandal, San Diego's new mayor-elect had enough. Is it possible to move forward with this leadership? I'll be evaluating all leadership in all departments here in the coming days and the coming weeks. That's part of my role as, as the mayor. Chief Lansdowne plainly said any decision about his future was out of his control. Every time there's a problem, people want to play the blame game. I get that. Uh, let me make it real clear. I'm an at-will employee. I can be released for absolutely any reason. You don't need a reason to release me. His last day on the job, the chief faced his final scandal. A police officer was arrested and charged with drunk driving. The police spokesman broke the news. Well, she was passed out in her vehicle. The decision to resign was the chief's uh, and the chief's alone. I told him that I would support his decision. It only took a day to announce Chief Lansdowne's successor. There was no national search. The mayor-elect said the right person was already in the department. Congratulations, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. There were immediately questions about whether Chief Shelley Zimmerman was part of the problem. Her rise in the department took 31 years. You're either in the club or you're not in the club. She talked a good game. For those very few who do not fulfill our standards, your failures will not be tolerated. She brought back the Professional Standards Unit, the anti-corruption arm of the department, which Lansdowne dismantled to save money. She welcomed outside help, including an audit of police practices and procedures from the Department of Justice. We're all for it. She ended up getting more than an audit. It's not every day you see an attorney welcome a federal investigation into his client. But that's exactly what happened. There will be a separate criminal investigation led by the U.S. Attorney and the FBI. We believe every rock should be turned over. I is the chief of police, and we as a police department are not going to tolerate this misconduct and betrayal of our badge and our profession. It sounded like a turning point. But there are still unanswered questions. Why wasn't all the evidence turned over during Arevalos' trial? Is it possible to change a corrupt culture by hiring an insider? How much will corrupt cops end up costing our city? The Department of Justice has already started work. We're just begun. We'll, we'll let the facts speak for themselves. They've pledged to root out corruption. We will call it as we see it. And make sure an admission like this is never made in San Diego again. How early on in your training did this occur? Since day one.
There is no timeline for how long that DOJ criminal investigation will take. As for the police chief, she has already started holding community meetings designed to gain the public's trust back. Team 10 will, of course, continue to investigate police culture and conduct. We could not do it without courageous and ethical cops who have already come forward, tired of seeing their profession marred and reputations tarnished. They are watchdogs on the inside, shining light in the darkest of places. For all of us at Team 10, I'm Mitch Blocker. Thanks for watching.